Okay, Hammy here. Today we're going to talk about section 2 of chapter 13 on recombinant DNA. Uh, we're going to cover three things. Uh, how do scientists make copies of the DNA they find? How is recombinant DNA used? And how can we take genes from one organism and insert them into another organism? Uh, first off, a little discussion on the tools of microbiology. Um, getting the DNA out of the cells, that's the easy part. Uh, some of you remember last, back to last chapter when we extracted DNA out of a strawberry. Remember, it's the old scientist snot on a stick. Very simple process, uh, some Dawn dish soap, some salt water, mushing up the strawberry, getting the cells to open up, getting the DNA out. That's the easy part. The hard part then is finding on that DNA, finding the gene. Uh, some scientists liken it to finding a needle in a haystack. Well, obviously this is a little over-exaggerated needle, but if you, scientists, they're creative, how would you get find a metal needle in a haystack? Well, if you think about it and you can come up with possible solutions, for example, using a magnet, you could, that would attract the metal, you could get the needle out of the haystack. So scientists have developed methods to, for finding the genes for certain traits that they need. One of the uh, first scientists to, to work with a specific gene that we, is very commonly used now is Douglas Prasher. He was a biologist, worked with this jellyfish out of the Pacific Ocean that did does this really cool stuff. You shine a UV light on the jellyfish and they glow this bright green color. It's really cool. Um, they, they found this GFP or green fluorescing protein and he wanted to find this gene so that he could link it with other genes like human insulin or human growth hormone and if he could attach this fluorescing protein along with the human gene when they insert it into the bacteria if they grew the bacteria and they shine a UV light on the bacteria they would know they got the human gene in if it would if they got the GFP protein as well. So he wanted to use it as a marker to see if his other genes he wanted to experiment with got into the bacteria as well. Well, he made the mRNA that matched the genetic code for the green fluorescing protein. And then he searched in the jellyfish's sort of genetic library of sequences to find that gene. Once he found the gene, he had to, in the mRNA sequence, he then had to find the gene in the DNA. So what he did, and, and this process is, is called a southern blot. Southern blot. Okay, the southern blotting method. There we go. And real simple without getting too specific about this, this process can be pretty complex. Uh, what they do is they, they take gel electrophoresis, which you'll learn about here in just a second. They take the DNA from the jellyfish, they chopped it all up, they ran it through this gel electrophoresis, which separates it into pieces. They would then smoosh that gelatin, put a heavy book on it, put it on a special type of membrane that would push the DNA down into the membrane. And then they'd send in these little DNA probes with specific sequences. Uh, they'd be little radioactive probes for special sequences of the mRNA that they knew the, the DNA for. So they were trying to find the DNA gene for this GFP, this green fluorescing protein. And then they would zap that membrane with uh, x-ray and they would show up the little pieces that would match up with the gene they were trying to find would then show up on their x-ray film and then they knew which pieces uh, which sections of DNA contained that gene for the green fluorescing protein. Now today uh, besides the southern blotting technique we've scientists are developing a computer databases. One is called a DNA blast website that we use in actually in BioAP you can find 
the genetic sequences of all kinds of genes from all sorts of organisms. Uh, so computers have really aided scientists in this process as well. Once they find the DNA, they then need to be able to cut the DNA into small pieces. So taking you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of base pairs and just cut out the small section where their gene is. Well, they found these things called restriction enzymes. Okay, what a restriction enzyme will do is cut DNA at a specific base sequence. You remember the bases, A's, T's, G's, and C's. So this is an example down here in the picture of EcoR1. Okay, EcoR1 will cut whenever there's TTAA. So you it's kind of the same here, then here on the, the bottom, the complementary strand, it's backwards. It will cut kind of at an angle, so it'll read along the DNA, read, 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 and every time it gets to that sequence, okay, it will cut it apart. Now notice it's not a straight cut, but it's kind of an angled cut, and you leave little sticky ends here. There's little base pairs that are exposed. This will be important later when we try to take this gene that we just cut out and put it in uh, another piece of DNA, like in a bacteria. Uh, there's other restriction enzymes like BAM1, uh, HIND3. There's all sorts of restriction enzymes, and they each have a different nucleotide sequence where they cut at. So scientists will use various. They're, they're named after usually the strain of bacteria where they found the restriction enzyme in. Okay, once they have the DNA all chopped up, the next step is to separate out those pieces. Uh, they have a very interesting way of doing this, actually with a process called gel electrophoresis. By gel, uh, stands for gelatin. It's a lot like jello, almost, like a clear jello. And so you, you have a mold, you pour this gel, and there's little wells or, or pockets in one side, and you load your chopped up DNA into those wells. You submerge it under some type of solution that, usually a salt solution or some type of buffer, and a power source, and you run electricity through that gel. So DNA is negatively charged. Remember, opposites attract. So the DNA will be attracted to the positive side of the gel. Okay, so the DNA or the electrical current is going to run through the gel, and as it does that, it's going to drag the pieces along with it. Now, what scientists have noticed is as the as the the pieces of DNA are trying to wiggle and make their way through the gelatin, the little pieces can go much faster. So your little short pieces of DNA will travel further than the big pieces of DNA that have trouble wiggling in between those little molecules of gelatin. And so they'll stop it once it gets close to the end. You take a special lights and lamps and you take a picture of it and it'll look something like this over here. Where here you see the row of wells where they loaded the DNA samples. Now you take one, you know, one, uh, a tube of DNA chop it up with a restriction enzyme, and then with electricity, you can separate the, all the pieces out. So little pieces up here, short pieces of DNA clumped together here, longer, 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 to the biggest pieces being back here closest to all. They didn't make it very far. Okay, the little pieces were much, kind of were faster in the little race to the edge of the gel down here, okay? Once they have their, their piece, their gene, that they cut with the restriction enzyme, they separate it out from all the other pieces in gel electrophoresis, then they need to use the DNA. Okay. Well, first off, what is the base sequence on that gene? So what are the A's, the T's, the G's, the C's, the genetic code? What is that code? Okay. We have machines that will, will read the sequence for us now. Uh, they can also use these colored nucleotides. So what they do is they, they take their piece that they want to read and get the genetic code off of. They'll mix it in four different mixtures. So here you see the four bases. C is blue, G yellow, A red, thymine green. And these dyed bases, they'll have all the other bases in there except all the T's will be dyed 
green. All the A's in this solution will be dyed red, and they'll have all the other bases in there as well, but only one base per solution will be dyed. And when one of those dyed nucleotides, when they put their DNA strand in, they put in a bunch of uh, DNA polymerase, so it starts copying the DNA. Well, every time it gets to a T, and it puts in this solution here, it will put a one of the dyed nucleotides on there and it will actually stop replicating. So sometimes it'll use a normal T, sometimes it'll use a dyed T. And they take all the pieces and again they run it through gel electrophoresis again and they get something like this over here where they can actually it'll sort of be a staggered gel and the shortest piece and they can just read right down through it. So by using different colored A's, T's, G's, and C's, DNA polymerase, allowing it to replicate and starting to make copies of these pieces. Every time it stops at a base, it'll stop, it'll make a different size piece. And so they just read from, you know, short, longer, long, next longer, 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 longer. And as you read from short to long, there is your base sequence, G, A, C, T, G, A, A, G, C, T, G, T, T. And the, they take the complementary base sequence, okay? So they look at the complement, they look at the complement of it, and now you know the exact order of base pairs in your gene that you are trying to figure out. You then tell these little DNA synthesizer machines to take your gene and they can actually make lots and lots and lots and lots of little pieces of your gene, little short uh, segments of DNA with your, with your gene on. And again, you can cut them with restriction enzymes. And if you cut some natural DNA, and your gene that you just made with the same restriction enzyme, eco R1, they'll have the same sticky ends so that your DNA gene that you just made with the machine, you can stick it into a piece of natural DNA in an organism because the sticky ends will match up and you cut them both with the same restriction enzyme, same sticky ends, you'll get some of your new pieces of DNA to stick into natural pieces of DNA. So now you've produced recombined DNA, recombinant DNA, or so we often abbreviate it RDNA. So you've taken natural DNA and now you've found a gene, you've decoded it, you've made copies of it, and you're going to stick it into like a bacterial DNA, piece of bacterial DNA. You've made recombinant DNA. The last thing that scientists want to do is take that copy of the DNA and try to make millions of copies of it. Uh, they have a special, again, a special process. Okay, I told you scientists were ingenious. They've come up with this way to make millions of copies of their DNA that they just synthesized. Okay? And actually, a uh, unique process. It looks almost like your March Madness tournament bracket down here, right? So you start with your original piece of DNA. The first thing that you're going to do is you're going to heat the strand, 94 degrees Celsius, almost to boiling. Okay? You're going to heat it. That's going to pull the two strands, okay, each side of the DNA. It's going to pull the DNA apart. They're going to add primers for DNA replication to start. And then they're going to add DNA polymerase. Okay, so, and it's actually interesting, the DNA polymerase that they use for what we often call PCR, they found DNA polymerase out of bacteria in Yellowstone Park in the hot springs. So this DNA polymerase can withstand these really high temperatures that you're using to separate your DNA. So they use DNA polymerase from these hot spring bacteria and they will build the new complementary strands on the template strands and then you cool them back down so now you have you started with one copy after one cycle you have 
two copies. Well, this procedure is repeated over and over and over and over. And after a few cycles, a few dozen cycles, you can actually end up with millions of copies of your gene. So here they show it just going on. So they'll, they'll put it in the machine and they'll start it and they'll let it run, run, run. They'll let it run overnight. And until the morning, you've got millions of copies of your genes that you can then go back and work on it and try to insert it in a bacterium. On BioAP, we actually take the GFP gene and we insert it into E. coli. We can actually plate little colonies of bacteria and when we grow it in our incubator here at the high school level even and we'll go back in the middle room, we'll shine a little UV light on it and they'll glow really green. So, But we, we have to have copies of that gene in order to insert in them. Okay, so hopefully you've learned a little bit about today how scientists will take DNA, how they find the gene, how they cut it out using restriction enzymes, how they insert it into new organisms, and how they make copy after copy of the DNA. Okay, in the next section then we'll look at how can we actually change bacteria, animals, plants, how can we actually make new things with some of these processes.